Um, thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come here. It's an honor to be here, and I'm really happy to present to this audience of biophysicists. Um, I um, <coughs> talk to you today about some work that we've recently completed in my lab, um, looking at transmembrane proteins uh, using the optical computers. And I'll hopefully convey to you why that's so exciting in the next few minutes. Um, but first, a little bit of an introduction to my lab and what we do, because I'm relatively new as a PI. Um, we're interested in developing techniques to enable the single molecule study of biological macromolecules, mostly proteins. So transmembrane proteins and chaperones are our kind of two specializations. Uh, but of course, there are many little side projects on the go as well. Um, and we do that through developing different attachment strategies, which are useful for when you're trying to apply forces to molecules. Uh, we look at ways of looking at transmembrane proteins, which is what I'll be talking about today. Um, we also develop microfluidics, uh, because in order to be able to look at uh, yeah, membrane interacting proteins, transmembrane proteins, you want to be able to establish a stable uh, lipid bilayer or other kind of membrane. And so we also look at developing different types of membranes for working with the microfluidics. And as I said, the proteins that we work with are being measured um, under force, and they're typically uh, yeah, chaperones and transmembrane transporters. So that's my overall kind of lab vision. And specifically, we are motivated to look at single molecules. Um, and I'm going to show you this illustration to give you an idea of one of the reasons why. So this is St. Mary's Tower in Cambridge. Uh, you can go to the panoramic view over the city. Um, and if you were to go there, uh, some of you might go very quickly to the top, while others might go a little bit more slowly. And the same is true for the function of proteins. Uh, so if you look at identical proteins, some of them will be functioning much faster than others. And it's only really single molecule techniques that give us access to those dynamics on the individual molecule level so that we can see subpopulations. So we can see some that are moving faster, some that are moving slower. And why is this important? Well, because proteins undergo large conformational changes, large structural rearrangements as part of their function. Not all proteins, of course, but very many. And many of these proteins are, again, transmembrane proteins. Um, and these are drug targets, of course. Um, I think the large majority of drugs that target proteins are actually targeting membrane-related proteins. So it's important to study these. And here is an example of a so-called elevator mechanism transporter. And you can see the uh, substrate binding domain shown in uh, turquoise is sliding relative to the scaffold domain shown in gray um, in the motion that's required to transport the substrate across the membrane. So dynamics actually dictate function. And that's why it's really nice for us to be able to measure these dynamics on the single molecule level and see them in real time. And how do we do that? We do that using the optical tweezers. Now, apologies to those of you who know exactly how this works, but I want to, because this is quite a broad audience, I want to give a very quick introduction to how you can actually make your own optical tweezer. So, you need a laser beam. And as many of you will probably know, laser beam has a region of highest intensity at the center. So this means that if you shine this laser beam through, for example, a buffer solution containing glass microspheres of around a micron in diameter, um, when one of those microspheres enters this beam, it will feel two different forces. First one uh, relates to the scattering of photons off the surface of the sphere. That will push the microsphere away from the laser beam. And the second one, which uh, is a typically much stronger force for a yeah, high-quality focused laser, um, is called the gradient force. And that results from the photons traveling actually through the microsphere and refracting. Um, and then that creates a force that pulls the bead into, or the microsphere, into the region of highest intensity of the laser. So this is still not optically trapped, though, because this will continue to gradually drift away from the laser. So we need to create a second region of highest intensity and we do that, in this case, using a lens. And when we do that, you can see that the microsphere is now drawn to where the two regions of highest intensity intersect. And now it's being held by the laser beam, which means if I now move this laser beam, I can manipulate the position of that microsphere. And because this microsphere could be pushed or pulled out of this focal region by forces being applied to it, I could actually measure the magnitude of those forces 
by placing a photodetector here and seeing the deflection of that laser beam. So how do we apply this to studying proteins? Well, um, there are many different geometries for doing this. I'm just going to show you the one that we use in our lab most commonly. Um, and that is where you tether your protein between two laser beams, each holding one of these glass microspheres. Um, in this case, we connect the protein to two very long uh, DNA handles, we call them. It's just double-stranded DNA. It's unstructured. Um, it provides a scaffold that gives us a known mechanical signature. So we know that we're only picking up one tether and not multiple. It also provides some separation between the protein and the laser beams, which means that we don't cook our sample. And now that I have these two positions and we have the protein trapped between them, we can apply a force to that and therefore unfold the protein by moving one laser beam away from the other and refold it by bringing it to the other again. So this is the most kind of classic optical tweezers unfolding experiment. Um, here are the signals that you send to move that uh, second laser beam, and here is what you would detect uh, upon calibration at the photo detector. And this little step that you see here in the upward trace is an unfolding event, and as you relax the force, you see a refolding event. Now this is all obviously schematic, but it's just so that you know what my data looks like later on. Um, of course, this tells me a lot about the interactions that are holding together the protein, um, but there are other reasons why you want to look at these things using optical tweezers, specifically. So the mechanical stability of the probe structure, that will change depending on the conditions that you're measuring in. That could be important for your molecule of interest. We can probe along almost any reaction coordinate. So you can attach these DNA strands in various different places on the protein. And that can be quite powerful because in certain measurements, like in FRET, you're limited because you need to have your dyes in, in close proximity. Um, you can obtain relatively precise length changes. Of course, this is very dependent on which field you're in, what you see is precise. I think one nanometer resolution is quite nice. And you can also do something which you can't really do very easily with optics-based methods, which is look at the strength of different interactions. And that's something that I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about today in the context of the protein that I'm interested in. Um, but what do I mean by that? So I could have two domains that I pull apart, and the force that I, is required to pull those two domains apart is actually telling me a lot about how they interact. And another benefit is that you can access dynamics over quite long timescales. Now, I just showed you unfolding and refolding. You can also measure in a more passive mode, where instead of destroying the protein that you're interested in, you actually just let the beads sit in a certain position and watch the protein fluctuate. So it will actually pull on the beads, and you can detect that signal if it's undergoing a conformational change during its functional cycle. <coughs> so unlike methods that rely on fluorophores that can bleach, you can actually do this for very long periods of time. Of course, there are other things that can go wrong in these measurements. But we've managed to measure one molecule for two hours in my lab recently, so it's quite nice. OK, so finally, which is the system that I'm going to be talking to you about today? Um, this is OPUA. OPUA is an ABC uh, transporter, so it's an ATP-driven homodimeric structure. It looks like this. And uh, this is work that's done in collaboration with Bette Pullman's lab at the University of Groningen. Um, they've been studying this protein for many years in functional assays, but also structurally. Um, but of course, I wanted to come along and do some single molecule work there. So let's talk through the overall structure of this protein. Um, it has a substrate binding domain. This is actually going to be the focus of the talk today. Um, I like to kind of do this to illustrate this protein. Um, and the substrate binding domain, as the name suggests, binds the substrate, which is glycine betaine. You'll see what that does in a second. Uh, it has a scaffold domain, which provides structural integrity. A transmembrane domain, which is what the substrate is transported through to travel across the membrane. An ATP binding domain, as I said, this is an ATP powered machine. And a cystothionine beta domain, which binds another substrate, which is cyclic dye AMP. And again, I'll go through the role of each of these, um, but the main take home message is that it's a transmembrane protein and that we're going to be looking at the interactions of the substrate binding domains. So please focus on these things in particular. And what does it actually do, this protein? Well, um, 
This is my physicist's view of a cell. Uh, it is a protein which restores cell turgidity under osmotic stress. So let's say your cell starts to uh, accumulate too many ions inside because of an osmotic stress externally. Um, you want something that will bring in compatible solutes that will neutralize that and restore the original shape of the cell. And so that is where OPUA comes in. It brings in glycine betaine. And it does that until the cell has restored its original perfectly spherical shape. Um, but of course, you don't want to keep doing this indefinitely because you will lie the cell. So that's where the second molecule comes in. It's actually a safety break. So cyclic diAMP actually will bind here. It doesn't stop the substrate binding domains from binding the substrate, but it stops the transport of the substrate through the transmembrane domain. And of course, a lot of work was already done in Bert Polman's lab to characterize this in detail. So here you have a transport assay of glycine betaine um, with ATP supplied uh, to the protein in a vesicle. And I think this is regular active labeled glycine betaine. Um, and what you can see is that as you increase the internal ionic strength, in other words, um, yeah, you mimic osmotic stress in vesicles in this case, so the transport activity, the import of the glycine betaine, increases. And here you can see the role of this emergency break that I was talking about, the cyclic di-AMP. Um, in this case, you can see that over time, if you have no cyclic di-AMP present, that's the blue line, uh, the uptake of glycine betaine will just continually steadily increase. Whereas if you do have it, it's pretty much non-existent. So it's indeed an inhibiting uh, molecule. And we do also have some cryo-EM structures of OPUA, um, and it was already mentioned today that we have you know, a lot of beautiful static structures and that we want to look at dynamics. That's exactly what we're doing here. Uh, so we know that when there's no substrate bound, we're able to resolve the fact that these ATP domains are separate from each other. We cannot see the substrate binding domains. They're presumably all over the place. You can't really see the CBS domains either. And then um, in the presence of glycine betaine, so the substrate, and ATP, you can see that the ATP binding domains are close together. You can actually only resolve one substrate binding domain, though. So a lot of questions remain about how these substrate binding domains actually interact with either each other or the protein um, main body, let's call it, so the transmembrane helices, um, and also how that's regulated by salt because that is the way that the protein detects osmotic stress. So some work was initially uh, started by Marco van der Noort in the Pommers group um, using single molecule FRET to observe these two MBPs. So what Marco did, he labeled the same position on each of these uh, monomers of the dimer um, with a donor and accepted dye, and then he performed confocal microscopy with pulse interleaved excitation um, and what he did was he did this measurement in high salt conditions and low salt conditions. So starting with the high salt, you can see that the apparent threat is in general relatively low. Uh, this indicates <coughs> that the two substrate binding domains are in general, potentially they're fluctuating around because there's quite a broad distribution, but they're in general not in very close proximity. However, under low salt conditions, suddenly you see a dramatic increase in the high FRET population. So the two substrate binding domains under low salt conditions are somehow interacting. But what this FRET doesn't tell us is what the geometry of that is. So there are different possible models. This, these is, this is not all of them, of course. Um, but just to show you some ideas that we had before we started the optical tweezers measurements, um, these are different uh, structures which would give us those kind of FRET efficiencies. Of course, shown very schematic. So we still had a lot of questions uh, relating to how these uh, geometry changes occur that we could then address using the optical tweezers. So uh, this is the construct that we used. So this is work done by Leanne van der Slane, who's an amazing uh, PhD student. And um, this is, again, the structure shown schematically. And here's a more kind of realistic scale version, where you can see, again, we have a, Heather, now in place of the fluorophore in the previous construct, on our uh, substrate binding domain. And this is now in a nanodisc. So for those of you who don't know what a nanodisc is, 
It's a patch of lipids that's surrounded by a belt of proteins that scuttle basically the shape of the nanodisc and the size. Um, so we chose a nanodisc that was large enough to accommodate the motions of the protein. Um, in order to allow it to function, and we did all of our functional studies also with the protein labeled in the nanodisc. And how do we actually do the measurements? So this is our optical tweezers set up in our C trap from Lumix, and this is where the magic happens. So here you see um, a sort of schematic of the, the fluid cells that we have inside, where first you have your two laser beams in one of the microfluidic channels, uh, which contains one type of beads, in this case, streptavidin beads. Um, then we have another channel where we have uh, antidoxygenin beads that have been pre-incubated with our protein, nanodisc, and DNA construct, which has um, biotin moiety at the end, basically. So that's now going to interact with this streptavidin-coated bead when we bring them together, which we do in this third buffer channel, um, which is free of beads, hopefully. <laughs> and so this is where you can now perform your measurements for extended periods of time. You can perform unfolding measurements, or you could observe the dynamics of the protein. Um, what kind of thing would you expect to see when you're unfolding this protein? Well, actually, to try and simplify the picture a little bit, we first just took an isolated substrate binding domain and unfolded that repeatedly. Um, and the contour length that you expect to see uh, when you do that and changing contour length, basically you can just take that to mean the change in length and using terminology from the model that we use to fit the data, um, is basically calculated from the number of amino acids multiplied by the average length of amino acid and subtracting the initial distance from the attachment point to the other attachment point. So this is how you would get an estimate. And of course, for that, you need some kind of idea of what the structure is that you're unfolding. So we work very much with structural biology to do this. Um, and so the predicted length is yeah, around 72 nanometers for a single substrate binding domain. And then what length changes would you expect for just the dissociation of an interaction and the different scenarios? Now, the numbers I want you to pay attention to are the ones in this gray box. I hope you can see them clearly enough. Um, but these are the changes in length that we would expect between these states and this sort of stretched state, which is what we're basically doing when we're applying our forces to the two substrate binding domains. And that will then tell us which of these interactions we're seeing, if we see an interaction at all. Okay, so first of all, some sanity checks, because you know, you're pulling on single molecules, you want to make sure that you know what you're pulling on. Um, so as I said, we did some unfolding of just this substrate binding domain. We actually had another attachment point at the point where it tethers into the membrane. And when you do that, you see this green trace, which actually has exactly the length that we predicted for a single uh, domain. So, And then if you do it for the whole full molecule, so what's illustrated here, then you get something that is exactly twice that length. So again, sanity check complete, very happy. Right. But you can see that this unfolding pattern is not very trivial. So we enlisted the help of Jan Stevens uh, from our molecular dynamics group that's in-house in Groningen, that's the group of Sievert, Jan Marek. Um, and what he did was he performed uh, steered molecular dynamics simulations to see if he could recreate the same intermediate steps in the unfolding that we were able to see. And in fact, he did. He did see some variation between the replicas, which matched relatively nicely to the variation that we see in the patterns when we unfold. Uh, but the general trend that he observed was that the protein seems to unfold in two main parts, which I've illustrated here as a red lobe that unfolds first, followed by blue lobe. And this is consistent amongst all of the unfolding traces, even though sometimes the events occur in different order, but that's because it's a stochastic process, so that's not unexpected. And here are some more traces. So we obviously also want to know whether binding of substance actually has any impact on the stability of the substrate binding domain. Uh, so this is something that yeah, also serves as a sanity check for me. Uh, it tells me that the substrate binding domain is actually doing its job. I actually think it nicely hi highlights uh, one of the benefits of using optical tweezers that you can actually see has something bound to my protein. So this is a set of traces collected uh, without any substrate. 
And the, uh, the highlighted lines show you those intermediate steps that were seen in the previous slide. And when you add the substrate, it kind of goes off the page. <laughs> so very clearly, the binding of the substrate has a stabilizing effect on the substrate binding domain. Very nice. But what about those interactions that I talked about in the beginning? So those different scenarios where you have the substrate binding domains interacting like this or with the transmembrane domain. Well, what we did was we compared the data uh, under high salt conditions and no salt conditions. I mean, there's still buffer salts, but the salts that regulate off UA is, yeah, is absent here. And we looked for any additional events on top of the usual unfolding pattern. Because these additional events, anything shorter than this, anything here, would indicate some additional interaction that we're breaking. And I wouldn't be talking about it if we didn't find them. Uh, so we do see them. We see them much more rarely than, of course, the normal unfolding events. They typically happen as the first event when we're unfolding. So it's not something that reforms very quickly. And what we're able to see is, yeah, actually a range of length changes. I'm just showing two examples. But they range from around 11, well, 10 nanometers to 15 nanometers. Um, so I hope some of you are remembering all the different scenarios that we had before and trying to figure out which one was the, the solution. Um, and what we also see is that the, the low salt typically has more of these events and that they occur at higher forces. So this is actually in beautiful agreement with what I showed previously. So in the high salt fret, you had far fewer interactions between the substrate binding domains than you do in the left salt case. So here you have the interactions, and here you have more of these interactions, so it matches. So that's fantastic news for us. But we have this additional piece of information, which is we now can say which of these are the most probable. So these are the two that most closely resemble the length changes that we observe. Of course, we can't completely eliminate the others. There is another caveat, in fact, and that is this domain is attached by a transmembrane helix, and it's possible that despite the, the nano disk being quite a constrained structure that still allows some motion, but it's quite tight, that this might add some length. So we're still not completely sure, and we never will be, I suppose. Uh, but at least it's a very nice demonstration of what is possible with the optical tweezers now. So we can now study transmembrane proteins. That's never been done before. Um, and we can also start to look at their dynamics. So the sliding motion of an elevator mechanism transporter that I showed you at the beginning, that's something that we're working on right now. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And I'm very happy to take any questions. When you pull the protein out to full extension, do you pull it out of the membrane and unfold the transmembrane region? No. no. At least not to the best of our knowledge, and we, the, the lengths will add up. So we seem to not be disrupting that, because that's quite a stable interaction. Maybe I can ask a question. So um, do your experiments tell you anything about how the two substrate binding domains work coordinated? terms of bringing substrate into the one and then the other, or do they bring one in together? Um, how does that work? That's a very cool question. So that's something we should be able to see from our data where we allow the protein to move and we observe it in so this non-destructive form. Um, we do have a lot of our data. We haven't fully analyzed it yet, so I can't answer it yet, but maybe this time next year I'll have a good answer for you. Have to come back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beautiful talk. Um, I was wondering if you're also exploring other friend labeling schemes to sort of additionally confirm the different or distinguish between the different scenarios. Um, that's something that I haven't personally explored, not being the fret expert, um, but it is something that Marco is doing, definitely. So he's looking at um, actually working with Leanne. Uh, Leanne's making heterodimers of this protein. I think I'm allowed to share that information. <laughs> and then we're going to be able to see quite nicely the interactions. I think, yeah. Thank you.